Good morning, and once again, I am honored that you have chosen to join us for this online opportunity for worship here at New Covenant Community Church here in Akron, Ohio. My name is Tom Ulrich, and on behalf of our congregation, I want to welcome you and to thank you for your presence here for this worship experience. During this time, not only will we pray and share scripture, but we will also sing a hymn, How Firm a Foundation. It's number 361 in our Presbyterian hymnal. If you're on our email list, hopefully you receive the lyrics to this selection so that you can lend your voices in praise. If you are not on our email list but would like to be, we would gladly include you if you would kindly contact our church office or our church website at www.covenantakron.org. And now let us turn our hearts, our minds, and our souls to the one who makes the clouds his chariot and who walks upon the wings of the wind. And now together, let us worship God. Friends, we are children of God who are called to reflect God's image and to grow into God's likeness. We are citizens of the household of faith who are called to live by God's teachings and to recognize all people as our sisters and brothers. We are members of Christ's community who are called to welcome all people and to love as Christ loved us. Friends, we belong to God, and through God, we belong to one another. So may our hearts be one as we worship our Lord and lean upon God's firm foundation. Please join us as we sing our hymn. And we who have been thirsting for hope can find refreshment for our souls. And we who have been despondent and depressed 
can drink from the water that gives life. Therefore, let us confess our sins to the Lord, as I will offer a prayer on behalf of all of us, followed by a brief time of silence in which we can lift up our own petitions to God. Now, mindful that God's mercy is always greater than our sin, let us pray. Merciful God, because the stressful storms of life terrify and intimidate us, we often drown in doubt and become fraught with fear. You come to us when we are tossed by the wind and the waves, but we only see the ominous clouds that threaten us. Even when you speak the words of hope and life to us, we frequently mutter in despair and self-pity. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Forgive us when our professions do not match our deeds and redeem us from those occasions when our actions do not reflect our faith. Fortify us with your word so that we may discern your presence in unknown and unexpected places and we may courageously follow you throughout our lives. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Amen. This morning, our scripture lesson comes to us from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. Now, this passage immediately follows two momentous events, one murderous, the other miraculous. At the beginning of this chapter, Herod had delivered this death sentence to John the baptizer and had him executed. And perhaps because of that news, Jesus retreated to a deserted place by himself. But the crowds had followed. And Jesus noted, noticed their need in that assembly of 5,000 hungry souls. And through a miraculous event, he fed the multitude that had been threatened with hunger. So now in this text, the powers of chaos and destruction again threaten the believing community. So let us listen to what the gospel tells us about this episode as we read from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. And let us remember that this is the word of the Lord. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. 
And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Friends, this is a word from the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The situation was grim. The tempestuous political power of death and despair had executed and beheaded John the Baptizer through the hurricane of Herod's homicidal humor, hubris. The unruly forces then of famine and hunger had menaced the multitude with a monsoon of malnutrition until the Messiah managed a miracle. And now in this seafaring fiasco, it had infected Christ's followers with fear. As wild waves were battering the boat, as defiant winds were crushing their craft, and as the apostles were arduously working to sustain their own survival. But even as the storm stampeded across the water, even as the sea became savage, even as the wind lambasted the boat with its ferocious fury, Jesus, in the terror of that tempest, would not abandon those vulnerable victims in the vessel. For the sea, which for the early Christian community symbolized the chaotic forces that opposed the plan and purposes of God, the sea would not and could not overcome Christ. Since even in the midst of the most cataclysmic conditions, Jesus strides over the powers of chaos and destruction and the unruly powers of the sea. And I wonder if that is our experience today. Where perhaps the typhoon of the coronavirus has created a sense of insecurity and fear. Or perhaps the squall of political divisiveness that has escalated into a cyclone of cynicism and uncertainty has upset our equilibrium and we are left grasping for any sail that will somehow give us a sense of direction. Maybe the x-ray revealed a tendril-like tornado somewhere in our bodies and its funnel cloud has gripped us in the fog of fear, in the waves of worry, or in the storms of stress. Perhaps a windstorm of racial inequality has engulfed us through the heart-wrenching images that incessantly swirl around us. And in all of those circumstances, with the dark clouds occluding the light, we are wrestling with the rudder, combating the conditions, and looking for the Lord who comes to us in the storm. And in the same way, the church itself, our present-day community of faith, may also be battered by the billows as we are sent by Christ onto an, a dangerous and unpredictable sea. And when the ship of our faith is assaulted by some upsetting tsunami, the ones who are called to be fishers of people do not abandon the ship. But instead, we strain at the oars of our ark to be faithful in perilous times, listening for the voice that can keep the sound of the cyclone out of our ears. Because we trust and we believe and we know that even at the darkest part of the night, Jesus will come walking on the water, overcoming the chaos, overwhelming the waves, and overthrowing the threat. However, it is also important to recognize that merely the presence of Jesus did not immediately calm the storm. Even as Jesus walked upon the water toward the boat, the storm still raged around him. The threat did not immediately disappear. But yet Jesus was there to demonstrate to the disciples that they were not alone. Jesus was there. And Jesus is here. In the peril of a pandemic. In the squall of school reopenings in the cyclone of social unrest. 
Jesus is here. And even though we may wish that the turmoil and the tumult from the wind and the waves would miraculously cease, it may be that Christ bids us, like Peter, to step out of the boat and walk upon the water where we too can walk upon the white caps of controversy and inaugurate the new world which Christ reveals to us. Through the call of Jesus Christ, we can surge through the breakers of bitterness and through the currents of inequality and venture toward God's vision of renewal and reconciliation. And through the call of Jesus Christ, we can walk among the waves which oppose God's purposes and then journey toward that new horizon where all humanity can participate in a better tomorrow and where everyone is united in the harbor of hope. In June of 1998, Tory Merton McClure left Nags Head, North Carolina for France in a boat that she and her friends had built by hand. The boat, which was named the American Pearl, was a vessel that was 23 feet long and just 6 feet wide at its widest point. The deck was the size of the cargo bed of a Ford F-150 pickup truck. Her plan was to row that boat across the Atlantic Ocean. No motor, no sail. Something no woman and no American had ever done before. And it was a journey of over 3,600 miles across the North Atlantic Ocean. Professionally, Tori worked as a project administrator in the city of Louisville, Kentucky, her hometown. But her real passion was exploring. And rowing across the Atlantic Ocean was not her first big expedition. Several years earlier, she had become the first woman to ski to the South Pole. She was an accomplished rower in college and even competed for a spot on the 1992 U.S. Olympic team. But this excursion was different. Just five days after she had embarked on her journey, a storm disabled all of her long-range communication systems. And still after three weeks, she had covered over 1,000 miles, fighting the current and the wind. On some days, she traveled as little as 15 feet. Eventually, after a time with no hu human communication, Tori was able to contact a local cargo ship with a VHF radio. Happy to talk to another human being, she asked about a weather report which indicated that there was nothing dramatic in the next 24 hours. But what the weather report didn't tell her was that she was rowing right into the path of Hurricane Danielle in the worst hurricane season on record in the North Atlantic. After nearly three months at sea, she had covered more than 3,000 miles. She was two-thirds of the way there. But in the storm, in the hurricane, the waves were the size of a seven-story building, and her boat kept capsizing. Some of them were pitch pole capsizes, flipping her end over end, and rowing became impossible. She sprained her ankle, she broke her arm, and the waves were tearing her boat to shreds. She prayed and she prayed because she was unsure that she would survive that ordeal. Eventually, Tori set off her distress beacon and was rescued by a passing container ship. They found her abandoned boat two months later adrift near France. When Tori returned home, she was feeling disheartened and she had no money. She was having a hard time making the transition back into civilization. Eventually, Tori started to get her feet under her. She began, hang, began hanging out with her friends again. She met a guy and fell in love. She was even lifted from uncertain waters to a new job working for another Louisville native, a fellow named Muhammad Ali. One day at lunch with her new boss, 
Tori shared the news that two other women were setting out to row across the mid-Atlantic to do something that she had almost died trying to do. Muhammad Ali's response was classic. He said, you don't want to go through life as the woman who almost rowed across the ocean. And in listening to the voice of her advocate, she knew he was right. Tory rebuilt the American Pearl. And in December of 1999, she did it. She rode across the ocean. My friends, when we hear the voice of our advocate, the voice of the captain of salvation, the voice of Christ, encouraging us to set out upon the sea, I pray that we will have the courage to do it. Now I know that confronting the issues of our day will involve a risk. And I know that the wind and the waves may intimidate us. And I know that the turbulent circumstances in which we find ourselves may seem, may seem to be too overwhelming. But if we dare to take the commands of Christ seriously, then Jesus will not only be with us on the journey, but he will create miracles that make all things possible. And then all humanity can sail across the sea, sail through the storm, and discover not just a harbor of good hope, but a world that evokes new life. And isn't that the destination that all people desire? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, not only do you strive through the stormy chaos of our lives to save us from fear, but you also call us from our safe places in order to learn more of your mission. As we confront a world of storms and stress, a world laced with tension and terror, a world of increasing debt and increasing doubt, we pray that you would dance over the waves of our worry and lead us to your oasis of faith. Extend your saving hand to all who are tempest-tossed, and bring your peace to all who are afraid. Embrace with your comfort those who are feeling overwhelmed and raise to new life those who are drowning in difficulty. While we know that fragile is your world and delicate is your creation and costly is your love that redeems us all, we lift in prayer all those who yearn for your healing touch. Especially we pray for a former member with pancreatic cancer and her husband suffering from severe diabetes and who has recently lost part of his leg. We pray for a widow of a member's friend in Tennessee who died last week. We lift up in prayer a member experiencing some lingering symptoms from the coronavirus. And we pray for teachers and students everywhere who are making preparations to begin a new semester in some form. Guard them from the raging winds and the waves of worry and hold them close to you so that they would forever feel the wonder of the great physician working in their lives. As you bid us to follow you, strengthen us to follow you into the future that you are preparing for all your people. Equip every extension of the church to fulfill its calling. And we ask that you would permeate with your presence our sisters and brothers in Lebanon who begin their recovery from an awful disaster. Inspire everyone there who serves in any capacity with vision and vitality so that they may faithfully lead your people. And empower everyone contributing to the recovery effort, not only to employ the skills of their vocations, but to seek your vision so that they may joyfully and energetically 
utilize their gifts and talents to promote hope where there is heartache and to bring renewal where there is ruin. Because you come to us in every situation, O Lord, we pray that your example would inspire us for generous and gracious living so that we may serve your mission in all of our daily tasks. Continue to meet us in the storms of our lives. And just as you lifted Peter from the water, lift us from despair to hope, from distraction to focus, and from death to life. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught his disciples when praying to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. By offering our gifts to the Lord, we invest in shaping a world where everyone is loved. By giving our talents, we serve in fashioning a world where justice rolls down like the waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. By committing our lives to God's work, we participate in creating a world where everyone has warm food, clean water, health care, and friends. Our gifts stand for our hope to repair the world, to demonstrate God's love, and to be the body of Christ together. For it is in giving that we stay connected to what is really important in life. Therefore, in response to what God has done for us, and in our service as disciples of Jesus Christ, let us prayerfully consider how we can share our financial and our human resources in order to make a difference in the world. Friends, may you receive a blessing as you bless our fellow human beings through your gift. And now because we know that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able, able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. May you, in spite of any storm you encounter, abound in hope. And wherever you go and whatever you do, may the living Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go above you to watch over you beside you to befriend you, behind you to encourage you, within you to give you peace, and before you, to show you his way, both now and forevermore.